I will largely be taking a multilateral development bank type perspective and what, it, uh, what is needed to get MDBs to change in this changing environment and also from an Africa perspective. What, what we see very dramatically is how rapidly things are changing. I mean, I think all of you are aware of the changes that are going on. Uh, at dinner, we were talking last night, and from my vantage point, the last four or five years have actually seen tremendous amounts of change, particularly as they apply to the countries that I work on. Um, the fact that when the original MDBs were talked about, uh, you know, OECD countries basically accounted for two-thirds of the global GDP, Right now, non-OECD countries are 50%, and the projections are that by 2030, 60% of GDP will come from non-OECD countries. Um, I recall the discussion when the MDB debate was taking place. It was largely about, okay, how much resources can countries mobilize, and then how much aid can we generate to bridge the gap? And if there was anything left over, let's talk about debt forgiveness. I think that discussion has changed significantly. I mean, I think today, Yes, I think we need to do much more in terms of helping countries mobilize domestic resources, but they've grown fourfold in the past decade. So the countries are actually beginning to deliver on the domestic resource mobilization agenda. Uh, there are some estimates which say that developing countries mobilize about $8 trillion worth of domestic revenues, and the IMF projects this will go up to about $12 trillion. So it's a large chunk of money which will go towards financing the Sustainable Development Goals uh, agenda. Uh, I won't go into uh, illicit financial flows, but that's again sort of another five, eight hundred billion slushing around annually, which we need to try and come to better grips with. But to me, from, from, from the African perspective, you know, when you talk to African ministers of finance, the first thing they sort of throw up their hands about is, oh, ODA is under pressure, and you know, we don't want to spend the time and the effort. There are new players in town. Why don't I catch a plane to Beijing, uh, go to Brazil, go to India? and I can get much faster the sorts of resources I need. And the question is, how does one deal with this phenomenon? Because we are confronted with this every single day, whether it's financing an energy project or a road project or just general sort of debates, et cetera. There's also the new bilaterals. Um, we were in Beijing the other day, and um, the Chinese would like to have a seat at the table on the board of the African Development Bank, but our governance structure is such that does not allow us to do that. Uh, and so they gave us $2 billion of parallel financing uh, and basically said, use it to augment your own resources. And uh, the Japanese, we, you know, did the same thing. We've got another $2 billion from the Japanese outside of the regular sort of uh, flows that we get from our traditional shareholders. How does a multilateral deal with these sorts of uh, emerging sources of finance, if you will? And how do you manage them and how do you make sure that we can bring them into the fold in a manner which yields the most benefits for, the, for our clients. How do we deal with philanthropy? Philanthropy is growing so rapidly, and there are vertical funds, et cetera. So you have all of these new players in town, and each and every one of them is uh, making very, very substantial contributions to the sorts of objectives that we want. And, and we are sort of in, in the crosswinds of all of this and trying to manage this rather not chaotic, but new game that is going on. Um, it doesn't, you know, the, the fact of the matter is the SDG agenda, if you actually look at it, is significantly more ambitious than what was talked about during the MDGs. I mean, you're talking about a whole sort of almost, you know, how do you finance transformation in how these countries run and manage themselves? Uh, investment requirements of three, four trillion dollars a year and huge gaps. So clearly, it's no longer about ODA. I also think it's no longer about just domestic tax revenues. And for me, it is about commercial flows. It is about the private sector. And it is about the mismatch that seems to exist. Because right now, uh, when I sit down and take a look at the financing needs of the continent, particularly infrastructure for Africa, and I see the large amounts of money actually sitting idle in pension funds, and I put some numbers out there, you know, $20 trillion in pension funds and, you know, $6 trillion in uh, sovereign wealth funds and so forth. How, how do you make, you know, bring about this match between demand and supply? Uh, to me, I mean, the pension funds looks long term, infrastructure finance is long term. It should be a no brainer for countries like Liberia, where people are paying 50 cents per kilowatt hour for electricity. Why are we not able to get pension funds to finance hydro in Liberia? 
what would it take for an MDB like the African Development Bank to make that deal happen? So we spend a lot of time trying to think about these sorts of things, and I'll give you one or two examples of what we're doing, just to provoke you a little bit into thinking how we can start doing things differently. Now, I just put up some numbers uh, to, to put this ODA debate into perspective. <coughs> a lot of time is spent discussing ODA, right? I mean, so in 2014, for example, Africa will get about $55 billion worth of ODA, which is 10% of the domestic <coughs> revenues that Africa mobilized, right? And only about a tenth of ODA, no, sorry, 1% of ODA goes to strengthen the tax systems. Uh, it's actually estimated that if more money went there, the return on investment, if you will, for every dollar invested in improving tax systems is $10. Um, and, that, and, that, and that's not happening. But for me, the key challenge is how do we, you see those big sort of circles, these are the countries that are attracting the sort of largest amounts of FDI, but it's beginning to grow in other areas, right? 50, 60 billion dollars a year projected in the next two to three years to go to 100 billion dollars a year. The same thing's happening with workers' remittances in Africa, 60 billion dollars or so a year, projected to rise significantly in the future. How do we bring about a structure of finance, if you will, which is able to take advantage of these massive amounts of flows to try and meet these objectives that we all agree with. So, so that's the challenge. Now, of course, six or seven countries on the continent account for a large percentage of FDI. And so, yes, it might be okay for South Africa. It might be okay for Nigeria. What happens to the Sierra Leones and the Liberias of the world? How do you make sure that private capital, commercial capital, can actually go towards some of these fragile states? It's another challenge. And, and, and I think a challenge for an MDB, uh, which we can talk about. Um, so yes, I mean, clearly we are in the business as an MDB of talking about good policies, developing sound institutions, you know, getting countries to mobilize domestic revenue. The traditional agenda that I think MDBs do best, right? So we are doing that. My, my fear is this is not going to be good enough in terms of trying to attract the kinds of capitals that we want to see going, particularly into the countries where the private investment will not go. Private investment will certainly go to sectors like energy, it'll go to transport, might not, will not go to sanitation, might not go to water, et cetera. So what do we do? At, at dinner last night, we were saying, what we would like to see at the, as a result of this little conference at the end of two days is not just conversations, although they're very, very good, but can we sort of reach agreement on a program going forward which will result in, I think, Kevin, you mentioned changing development or, or, or development finance. How do you change development finance? So I'll give you two or three sort of examples of what we've recently done, and feel free to, you know, debate these, critique these. One was the creation of, you might call it another multilateral, it's not actually another multilateral, but an institution called Africa 50 to finance African infrastructure. We realized very quickly that given our AAA rating and the amount of exposure we can take to some of the smaller, riskier countries, there was no way we could help African countries finance their infrastructure needs. So we've created an institution outside of the African Development Bank in which we are trying to mobilize $3 billion worth of equity from African governments, from foreign governments, from pension funds, et cetera. We've already incorporated this in Morocco last month or two months ago. Uh, we mobilized the first billion dollars or so. And the idea is to try and attract money for infrastructure finance in Africa, right? To the creation of such an entity. Uh, those of you who might be familiar with the Afri, Afri Exim Bank, which is a bank that does trade financing in Africa, was a similar brainchild of the African Development Bank a few years ago. We launched this bank, it sort of started doing trade financing, got feet of its own, and now is the largest provider of trade financing on the continent. What we're hoping to do is create an institution, which is Africa 50, which will become the largest financier of private infrastructure in Africa, right? One initiative. A second initiative that we've just done, we've opened up non-concessional borrowing to our concessional countries. Now, you know, so uh, you take ADF countries uh, who are only legible for ADF resources. This is similar to the IDA countries at the World Bank who are not legible for I IBRD resources. And uh, we've opened it up based on certain strict criteria. It's been very, very difficult to get this thing through given the history of HIPIC and MDRI and so forth. 
And a lot of people are saying, well, what is it that you guys are trying to do? Do you want these countries to fall back into the debt trap? Well, the fact of the matter is that sub-Saharan African countries are already mobilizing large amounts of money on international capital markets, seven billion dollars this year already. We are able to mobilize money at LIBOR minus 15 basis points. These countries are going to the market and borrowing at five, six, seven percent. For us, it made sense to open up this window to ADF countries to say, okay, subject to a certain pretty rigorous criteria, we will open up financing to you largely for infrastructure, possibly for some other sectors, but provided you do one, two, three, four, five. In other words, you maintain, manage your economies well, uh, the IMF signs off on it, you don't get back into a debt trap, and there's a whole list of criteria. If you're interested, you can go to our website and see. But the whole idea was, again, how do you try and crowd in more finance into these countries and leverage more commercial flows. We are already leveraging $6 for every dollar we lend right now. Our target is to try and make that 10, but the challenge I have, as I was telling you yesterday, is how do we make it $100 for every dollar we do? And any ideas would be useful. We've got new guarantee instruments, there are, there's a new risk management framework that we are trying to put into place. We've opened a new natural resource management center to better help African countries not just manage their natural resources better, but to use those as a building block, if you will, to crowding in other sources of capital into helping them diversify and so forth. And we've got through various strategies, gender strategy, fragile state strategies, initiatives to see how do we focus resources in areas where money is typically not going, right? But again, my own fear is that despite all of this, this is not going to be enough. And so the challenge for all of us collectively is to come up with very spe you know, specific ideas which will basically say, how do we have this sort of transformational agenda for Africa and indeed the rest of the development world? What can MDBs be doing differently? How can we move away from our focus on our own resources and the six, eight, 10, 12, 15 billion dollars we bring to the market every year? and turn the agenda completely around so that we're asking countries, how do we help you bridge your finance gap, and what is the role that we can play in that particular endeavor? Thank you.